Yeah. You have to eat it. Look, look at all this effort we went through. And then um, it obviously turns out the poisonous. <laughs> so we called it poison hotline. And, and they said, oh, no, no, it happens all the time yeah. this time of year. That's a sweet story. I'm glad it ended. Yeah, at the time, we almost we, we forced almost the boys poison. to poison. poison. <laughs> Hansel and Gretel, you know. It was a nice result of that. But the blossoms are so pretty. I actually kind of missed that building. I mean, I know it was I cold. It was really nice. Well, there was something nice about it. I could totally agree. Yeah, I felt safe there. Like they weren't about to bid us out and into another building. <laughs> and then they bid it us out. Oh, it was, it was a false sense of safety. Yeah. Just tell me when you're ready, Trey. I am not ready. Apologies for that. Okay, so um, Gemma, thanks for hitting record. Uh, oh, I think she probably has. Oh, there we're recording, yeah. So um, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming uh, for our fifth of five lectures that Trent Walker is giving for us on Buddhist, Buddhist poetry. Um, again, we're very grateful for him being here and uh, we're looking forward to the last in this episode. Uh, I've just gotten confirmation that there will be a, a, a video feed uh, through the university, not feed, but a kind of a YouTube link, which I'll, I'll send around. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll actually put on our Facebook page, the University of Otago Religion Program Facebook page. Um, so you guys can all access that if you've missed any episodes. Um, and just one more time, just to say thank you to the Dhammakai Education Foundation for supporting this and to Trent for coming all this way. Um, it's been a wonderful series of lectures and we know today will be another treat for us. So thank you all for attending and over to you, Trent. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you all again for being here, those of you here in the room, and those of you uh, joining uh, virtually, really appreciate uh, your your presence and all the ways that you've you've contributed to this week together. So, uh, I again really want to make sure that there's space for your questions, your curiosities, things you're wondering about today. This is uh, any time, including right now, is a good time to ask those things. So. Let me just give you a moment, as I've done before, for you to just, if you're here in the room, to jot down something that you're, you're still curious about, that you thought we would cover, but we didn't, or that um, came up yesterday, or that you're hoping will come up today, just something you're, you're wondering about or thinking about. And if you're joining us virtually, you can put that into the chat if you'd like. Um, if you're here, you can just, write it down or think about it. And, uh, let me just give you a moment to do that. I have two questions. Oh, already, okay. <laughs> Please, go uh, ahead. I, I read the poem number 44, the Dharma Unions. Yes. And some of your essay about the consecration of Buddha image. Yes. And my question is, the, the first, first question is from the poem number 44, uh, when people, consecrate a new Buddha image, they invite the Buddha relics mm. to come to be, to come to the new icon. Yes. Including the Buddha 10 perfections. Yes. The power of the Buddha of the past or the future, right? Uh, I don't have problem with the perfections of on the Buddhas in the past, present and future because they, they exist in abundance. But the Buddha relics exist in a limited number Mm. And be before this time, uh, there are many people building many Buddha images, and one of them consecrated the image. Mm. So if a new, new group of people build a new icon, and they invite Buddha image from everywhere, it, uh, even from the existing Buddha images, <laughs> yes. uh, will, will this constitute some sort of spiritual depth, uh, spiritual warfare, like because the, the Buddha relics exist in limited number. Mm. So when uh, people build new icon, they invite Buddha image from uh, Buddha relics from everywhere, right? Yeah. It means that the relics that exist in, in the existing Buddha images has to leave the Buddha image and come to the new, new icon. Mm. So mm. what does this mean? 
Yes, I never thought about this particular potential problem before. Let's let's take a look at the text and see uh, what we might learn. Uh, so this is the, the text that you're asking about. Yes. Um, this text is often known as Toyao in Khmer. Yep. Um, it, there's also an existing version of it in Thai that was probably composed in the Ayutthaya period. Yep. Um, and that, I have not found any manuscript evidence for it in Thailand, but there's manuscript and inscriptional evidence for it in Cambodia. Yep. And then in 1869, that version was translated into Khmer. So this uh, in the in the Thai version has the same kind of doctrinal problem that you've pointed out. So let's let's take a look at where that appears and what we might think about it. So this is a text that, as you mentioned, is used still today in Cambodia for Buddha image consecration rituals um, or Buddhabhisheka kinds of rites. So if um, we look at the beginning, it begins with this opening homage to with the, the Dharma and the Sangha. Yep. And then uh, it goes right into what you've discussed. There's this uh, portion later where the bottomy, these perfections, et cetera, are being invited, but it begins with inviting uh, relics. And as you pointed out, these are limited. <laughs> what is, so what does it mean to invite them? So when it says, we invite the relics of the Buddha and realms, both high and low, come here, come here quickly. May you fly swift and never be delayed. Merge with our new icon. Bring your bright rays ablaze with prismatic light. The relics of the victor in all cities on the Isle of Lanka, here in Jambudwipa, in high heavens, and down in Naga realms. Come, O relics, come quick. Enter into this new Buddha image. And then it goes into some of the very specific relics, like the four canines, etc. And I never thought about the particular issue that you raised. In other words, that this would mean that the relics in those locations and enter into a Buddha image and then they're stuck in that Buddha image until someone else conducts a consecration rite. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting to, yeah, I, the text doesn't say that the invitation is metaphorical. It says that they're actually supposed to come, but it also seems to imply that they somehow either go back or never really leave their resting places. Because of course, whenever this text is recited, they're being invited from the traditional places they are thought to be, not from whoever most recently performed a Buddha image consecration. Um, but it's interesting that the text doesn't deal with that issue. Um, and now I'd be curious to ask those who use this text in say a Cambodian context today, where similar kinds of parallels elsewhere in Southeast Asia, what they make of your question. Mm. So thank you for that. Yes, and okay, and the second question yeah. is in the, this poem, yeah. uh, next to the, this part, uh, it's about invitation of the Buddha Dhamma, the Buddha teaching and his uh, transcendent power, right? And mm. in your essay, you describe this as the Dhammakaya or mm. the Buddha spiritual body. Mm. But in the poem, it doesn't mention the Makaya, it just describes this thing as the Buddha spiritual power and, and his teaching. Yes. So what I wonder what is the definition of the Makaya? Because Steve Collin he defined it as the body of text of yes. the body of Buddha teaching, but but I think it can can mean the body of the Buddha spirit transcendent qualities as well. Yes. Yes. So let's again let's take a look at this passage and see what we can make of it. Um, so after inviting the various portions of uh, relics, uh, the Buddha's uh, rays or halo, uh, the uh, different perfections, the nine supreme states that constitute the Dhamma, uh, et cetera, et cetera, this is all invited. And one is inviting them to come into the image. So then I mentioned, I think in that 
essay about this is one way of understanding how in this Cambodian context and presumably in a another Thai context as well with the, the Thai language text came uh, that there's an understanding that the the dharma body of the Buddha is somehow being reconstituted in a sense. So in a consecration rite in Cambodia, uh, along with this text, uh, there's a key rite in which this, um, this core uh, text that's in prose, uh, with a little bit of verse at the end. And this is the, the subject of uh, Warame Malasat's uh, uh, PhD dissertation here at the University of Otago. Um, that particular text is recited and uh, the uh, person conducting the ritual uh, makes this connection between the physical image uh, and the discussion of all of these different jnana or knowledges of the Buddha that are tied to the, the physical body of the Buddha and tied to the, uh, new, the Buddha image to be consecrated, culminating in the opening of the eyes of the Buddha. And so that's the, the context in which I was framing it as the Dhammagaya of the Buddha. But you're right, in the text itself, uh, I don't believe that term appears. So maybe, maybe the way I framed it isn't precise um, because the, the text itself doesn't talk about it. It's this other text that's recited at this um, either immediately before or after that, that uses that term Dhammakaya explicitly. So Dhammakaya is more in term of Buddha consecration ritual, right? It's more like his transcendent qualities, right? In the, con in the context of the uh, Buddha image consecration ritual, I, I see it as something that brings together a point of union between the, these particular jnana, these particular uh, transcendent qualities of awakening of the Buddha and specific parts of the physical body. Now, this whole text is also called like the, in some literal sense, the Dharma of union, um, but the yoga, this, Union, I see the inter the text doesn't explain what bhakti yoga really means here, but I understand it as the union with this physical Buddha image with all of these particular jnanas and dhammas and parami and dhatu, etc., uh, all coming together in the image. That's this union that's being described. So it's analogous, I think, to the way that Dhammakaya is used as the uh, the union between transcendent qualities and the specific physical parts. I think the other thing that's happening here that I, I didn't explore as much, but I think would be worth exploring in more detail. And this shows up in a article by Francois Guizot in 1994. 1994. Um, and in that piece, he shows some of the close connections between ideas around the spirits or ghosts uh, that are in, in, sen in a sense inhabiting an image, what would be known as Kamao or uh, in, in Kamao or Pi in a, in a Thai context, those two are tied to the image. So there's a, a different kind of ontology that's taking place here. Uh, one in which physical images, just like um, an image of a tutelary deity or nekba in a, in a Khmer context is in the, inhabited by a, a, a spirit that is usually understood in non-Buddhist terms. I think a similar kind of logic is at work here. And understanding what's really meant by the invitation of the relics into the image, I think requires going into that non-Buddhist ontology. You don't have to frame it as not Buddhist, but the tradition itself sort of frames it as not Buddhist. So I think there's there's a lot to explore with. I'm sorry that I can't get into all the possible details of your question, but you, you've opened up some really key areas for exploration. Um, that's a nice segue to Eric's question there, which is there any evidence of non-Buddhist literary traditions influencing the aesthetic form, the aesthetic forms or techniques of Southeast Asian Buddhist poetry in the pre-colonial era, for instance, Islamic, Sinitic, et cetera? 
And similarly, is there any way, evidence of non-Buddhist literary traditions such as European, Christian, et cetera, influence in the colonial or post-colonial eras? So, say in a Thai context, there was certainly in a broader literary um, interest in Chinese writing, um, certainly like the Romance of the Three Kingdoms uh, became important from the 19th century. Um, but I haven't thought about any sort of particular uh, Sinitic or Islamic, say, in the case of Cambodia, Thailand, and Laos, among uh, areas that, among communities that were not primarily um, oriented toward Islam or to Chinese uh, religions, that kind of influence showing up in Buddhist poetry. Um, it's quite different in the case of uh, Vietnamese poetry, of course, where there's um, deeply abundant uh, influence and interaction with the broader East Asian and Sinitic uh, literary tradition. Um, and in some cases, it's harder to find clear evidence of specifically Buddhist kinds of influences on, on Vietnamese poetry, but we see this um, long and rich tradition of working uh, within and beyond uh, Semitic patterns. Um, and then the second part of your question, is there any evidence of non-Buddhist literary traditions, such as European Christian uh, influence in the uh, colonial or post-colonial eras? Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a book by S Stephen Berkowitz mm. on poetry written yeah. in the in the um, 16th century Sri Lanka in the Portuguese period. What's it, what's it called? Radicals? I'm thinking of something else. But yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I don't have that kind of top of mind at the moment in terms of liter European literary traditions. What, I mean, there the, the, the implication was more, I think, from memory that there was a kind of a, a That was placed more in a, the the kind of events of that period were placed more in a sort of a, a, a Sri Lankan kind of literary context, but I don't know. Yeah, poetry, Buddhist poetry, and colonialism. Thank you, yes. Eric. Wonderful. So yeah. the radical is not even in the title. I don't know what I'm thinking of. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. Is the is the short answer? <laughs> so there certainly is in the case of. Um, Evidence of non Buddhist literary terms and influence in the colonial post eras. For, so, for instance, in the case of Cambodian literature, um, many of the intellectual elite who were educated from the 20s, 30s, 40s uh, were reading in French, were reading French poets, and the kinds of novels and poetry that were produced in uh, Cambodian language venues in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were, all, were often informed by that kind of um, encounter with French symbolist poets, with French popular music, uh, with French writing of, the, of that period and of a prior period, particularly 19th century writing. So there, I think there's lots to explore how that those encounters ended up influencing poetry we might nominally call Buddhist or that interacts with, with Buddhist ideas. So for instance, uh, uh, Geng Sak, uh, an important Cambodian poet and intellectual uh, who wrote um, for many decades, but some of his most important work is from the 50s and 60s. Um, we see certainly an engagement and a reformulation of Buddhist ideas, but also one that's broadly informed by forms of uh, French and other kinds of non-Cambodian uh, uh, literary, philosophical, and intellectual traditions. So th I think there's a lot more to see how that might show up on poetry that we might label as Buddhist, but it sort of gets us to this question of you know, what really is uh, Buddhist poetry in these different cases. Um, Huyen writes, Hang Mak Te U, uh, was a modern Vietnamese Catholic poet, also well-read in French symbolism, and who also had traces of Buddhist thought and Chinese canonical poetry in his work. Fantastic. And Wayne, if you could write for us what the dates for, 
for this particular poet um, is. That would be great. Um, excellent. Okay. Um, so a similar period in which we see that beginning to develop in a in a Cambodian context. So again, it's like most of uh, these issues that would have developed first, I think, in a, in a Vietnamese context. In the Siamese case, writes Eric, uh, I think of the Portuguese, Islamic, and East Asian communities at Ayutthaya, um, but I know nothing of studies of literature at that court. So in the court literature of the Ayutthaya period, there's a constant invocation of the uh, ethnic and linguistic diversity of, of Ayutthaya. Um, and writers were profoundly aware of that and engaging with that. And we see into the Ratanakosin period in, of course, in the arts, these different kinds of influences as well. What I haven't seen is evidence that those writers were seriously engaged with the reading and translation of Portuguese, Islamic, and East Asian literature, and that that literature shaped what was going on. There's this, uh, it's like this popular image in the poetry and literature of that period that, that acknowledges that they're living in a cosmopolitan state, uh, that others, uh, other people with different ways of thinking and dress and, and being were present. Uh, certainly the work of Matt Reeder has brought uh, the way in which uh, ideas around ethnicity were articulated in Ayutthaya and Ratanakusin literary texts. But I, I would have to check again about this question of uh, really concrete literary influence other than uh, this engagement with Indic sources. Other questions or things you all are thinking about at this time? I mean, my, the only thing I would add to this is I, I have just my own interest in the sort of polemical use of Buddhist poetry by, you know, what were the, um, I don't know, what are the sort of uh, sectarian or political implications of some of these poems, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I think in the, what I'll be sh sharing today, there will be a little bit, there's not a, a ton that's sectarian or can, tied to religious politics mm -hmm. as much, um, but let's see if there could be things that I'm mm -hmm. missing there too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's always a good question to keep in mind. I haven't, because that's not the emphasis of my work, I haven't been paying attention to that and what we've been talking about so far, but I'm, I'm sure that element is present as well. And certainly it's present in how people read or make sense of these kinds of texts today and how they're being claimed into particular lineages. So certainly this text that we've been uh, discussing that uh, uh raised for us this morning, this is one that in a contemporary Cambodian context is really closely associated with certain uh, Moran or traditionalist monasteries that has a whole political connotation within the Cambodian context. Um, so there's a way that a text that on the surface doesn't seem to be connected to monastic politics can actually be quite deeply embedded in that and how it's used. So uh, with these questions in mind, and always feel free to bring uh, more questions to the fore, let's um, come back to this, the question we'll look at today, which is uh, that of, of pleasure. So over the, the course of the week, um, we began by inquiring around the relationship between Buddhist poetry and language, and that I tried to bring out through the particular journey that this single Pali verse, originally in the Puttavangsa, takes as it expands and is translated and becomes something newer and larger through the process of moving across different cultural and linguistic spheres in mainland Southeast Asia. And that was also a way to introduce us to how poetry shows up across these different linguistic contexts. What might remain the same in terms of performance practice, in terms of metrical forms, and what might change as we see these different forms and in interaction. Then we looked into this uh, question of aspiration and 
benefit under the broader heading of what I was calling prayer and seeing whether that was a useful term or a, a problematic term in trying to understand the ways in which these poems are structured, particularly this relationship between aspirations and the autobiographical elements. We'll see a little bit of that uh, surfacing again today. Then we went into this question of debt. Uh, that is uh, the way in which this key concept of uh, Guna in an Indic context and expressed in other ways in different Southeast Asian languages shows up as debt to parents as well as a, a range of other beings and the connection between those doctrinal ideas around uh, virtue and debt and narratives of mourning and loss. We saw some of those that connection to mourning and loss as well and those kinds of narratives showing up yesterday when we looked at ideas around some vega or shock or stirring. And they're um, both in the kinds of poems that we took a closer look at, those that are connected to these end of life rituals, as well as other ways that poetry around shock shows up. Uh, we saw some of these aesthetics of shock. We explored it as his work as, in the, as, as, as a rasa, as a kind of um, aesthetic uh, essence or taste or juice that we can um, see going on in the material or are there other ways to understand how shock is operating. So today we're turning to the last uh, theme that I wanted to bring up and in some ways this is the least developed theme in my mind. So again I really want to bring the rest of you in uh, to help me think through what's going on. Of course Buddhist texts speak uh, extensively about the pleasures of peace, of contentment, of bliss, of well-being. Uh, sometimes it's framed in terms of uh, uh, sukha, uh, this idea of health or happiness or bliss. And it's understood differently uh, in different contexts. Uh, other texts, particularly those connected to ideas around meditation and different Southeast Asian languages, speak to a different kind of pleasure, a spiritual kind of pleasure, sometimes referred to as bidi. Uh, that is this, this joy, this rapture, uh, this bliss. We'll, if we have time, we'll look at one meditation poem uh, that's very much invested in these kinds of ideas. At the same time, this deliberately using a term in English uh, that allows us to explore uh, what are emically speaking, perhaps different realms, but pleasure, uh, of course, is also tied to ideas around sensual pleasure and sensuality uh, in a Southeast Asian uh, Buddhist context. So particularly this idea of gamma or of sensual pleasure is one that shows up particularly as something to be critiqued in Buddhist, Buddhist poetry, but we'll also see ways in which uh, moments of sensual pleasure can be celebrated by Buddhist poets or uh, tied into narratives of longing or mourning. We, cert we saw certain elements of that in uh, our discussion of uh, Lili Palo the other day as well in that classic of, of Thai poetry. At the same time, much of what we've been talking about has centered on ideas around euphony, that is this aesthetic, pleasure or the beauty in sound. And there are different words in Southeast Asian languages that might be used to describe this. Certainly biru and kmai is one way of uh, understanding that are paira or pra in Thai or pa or munhung in a, in a Lao context that gets at part of the function, some would say even uh, looking at the work of Thomas Hudak, the a core function of Southeast Asian poetry is to be a source of aesthetic pleasure in the very sound of the poetry. Mm -hmm. That's part of what these dense structures of internal and external rhyme and alliteration are all working towards and why it's often such a challenge to capture uh, in English translation what's going on for a reader or listener of these, these bodies of work. Um, and that equally applies in a, in a Vietnamese context as well. And the very little bit we read from uh, Nguyen Yu's uh, The Tale of, of Kiyo or Duyen Kiyo, um, we certainly saw that 
that particular structure of rhyme and the, the mastery with which uh, he is able to make sound and sense and structure come together in a powerful way is a key part of why the poetry uh, has been enjoyed um, and, and memorized and held closely to people's hearts and lips over so many years. There's another dimension of pleasure that I don't know so much how to frame, and that's the enjoyment of, of other kinds of senses through this idea of aesthetic pleasure, particularly visual. We can also look at ideas around olfactory pleasure as well. But let's, I think I'm particularly curious about uh, this kind of expressions of aesthetic rapture um, that to me challenge certain dichotomies between what is considered an wholesome or unwholesome uh, state in, in, in a uh, Buddhist doctrinal context. So with that in mind, uh, let's explore some of these examples. I'd like for us to begin with a transitional piece, one that helps us think about this question of shock and, and its relationship to pleasure. And uh, that's through some examples from this masterpiece of Sutanta Prachi on uh, his Neriyah Nagogwat, or Journey to Angkor Wat. Um, this, this particular text was composed sometime between 1909 and maybe 1915. Um, and it, it's an account of a journey uh, that Sotanta Prachi An took from his native Batambang to the temples of Angkor Wat in uh, Siem Reap province that became possible after the retro retrocession of these Northern provinces of Cambodia that had been under Siamese administration since the end of the 18th century uh, to Cambodia. And so again, that legal retrocession took place in 1907. The journey itself took place in uh, 1909. Uh, as we discussed the other day in actually the first day, because Sotanta Prachi An was the poet who composed that very fine uh, Khmer version of the verses to invite a monastic to preach that was later translated by Ho Phong into Vietnamese. He, uh, that is, Un was a keen student of certainly Pali literature, but also Thai material as well, and was almost certainly uh, quite well read in the works of Sun Tan Pu, uh, whose style he is the closest analog to in Khmer. Um, and we see that, of course, in the, the very genre that he's chosen, this uh, genre that's known as uh, Niria in Khmer or Nira uh, in Thai, that is usually translated as separation. It's a, it's a travel poem that involves the author constantly reflecting back on their beloved who they have left behind at home, uh, reflecting on toponyms along the way, uh, engaging in close observation of, of nature and man-made structures and how humans behave, but always tied back into this formal structure of a love poem. And the very particular uh, form of Klon uh, this eight-syllable uh, poetry used for Nirat um, poetry in by the 19th century in, in Thailand, is also the one that's adopted by on, in his Khmer composition here. So we see this at the, the very beginning where he um, first invokes, this is from a little later in the text, very beginning, uh, he invokes his beloved who he's leaving from as he goes off on this journey. At times it can feel hyperbolic since he's only gone about two weeks, but the, the depth to which he describes um, missing home and missing his wife in this case is, um, made to be something profound in the text. Then as he goes through, he, he observes uh, all what he sees along this riverine journey on these uh, sometimes quite narrow sloughs uh, leading from Mapabong uh, across the Tonglai Saab and over to Siem Reap. And if, you, if you're at all familiar with Sun Han Pu's poetry, you, you'll note that often when he sees uh, people along the river, particularly women that he finds attractive, he, he comments on that in often in a very extensive uh, way. And it, it's, it's a way of commenting on his, his frailty, but it's also a way of him being honest about 
the ways in which visually he's enjoying the, the sights that he's, he's taking in. Un takes a somewhat different approach and his, his poetic oeuvre is much more explicitly Buddhist uh, than that of Sun Han Pu. And in that he makes, even the way he observes women or reflects on his own uh, ways that he's pining for his wife, very closely connected to uh, Buddhist ideas, including ideas around Sambhaga. So here, I wanted to sort of just bring us into this, this kind of tension between ideas of pleasure and ideas of Sambhaga. So as he's traveling around this uh, small stream uh, out to, to, towards the, the Laisap, he, he encounters um, a young girl who's uh, tr transplanting rice, um, saying how transient uh, that, and here he's you know, using a phrase, something like anicca, uh, like how impermanent or have pity on that life limb a uh, girl's life, stooping to sow seedlings scorched by the sun, her face plastered with mud and dusty earth. I mourn the strife and strain of those born poor. If she had riches, rank, and great renown, she'd dine and doze in lofty luxury, adorned with fine perfume and fair powder, hair trimmed and dyed, her complexion was, would shine. She'd flaunt her charm to captivate rich men. She'd be looked over never overlooked, but stained now by the sun and by the soil, she can ensnare and earn their love no more. And uh, here we have this sense that he's, uh, there's both a sense of attraction and revulsion <coughs> that's coming out uh, through the poetry. And we see this uh, show up again as we move to the, to the next page here on the right. Uh, and here where he writes, I sit perplexed, my gaze still on the girl, we reach on Song Sop, Molting Monitor. And there he begins to reflect on the debris that's clogging the pathway as he's, these are really, again, narrow channels as he's, they're trying to make it out to the Don Sa. And as uh, they, the boat, essentially, it's a steamboat gets stuck. Uh, he then reflects on the way that this sense of stuckness uh, can be mirrored with how living beings are mired in sensual pleasure. And that that um, is uh, what he sees as the metaphor. So at the bottom there, I see how tight the scum girdles the boat as lust would mount flesh when morals fade. Our bodies are soon trapped in that dark place. The, wheel, the reel is shrouded off and light is screened. Lust sears and singes creatures in the world to rue and regret base earthliness. The vessel's frame is like our human form. Though short of insight, cannot see the reel. The blades are wisdom that slices and shears. The floating scum is lust now dropped away. Escape from the shallows of sorrow and strife depend on brave wisdom, the paddle wheel. And this, in a sense, reminds us of his, the way he unpacks the metaphor of the different parts of the drum. He's taking particular Buddhist ideas and uh, bringing, in, uh, bringing them into this very concrete metaphor. The boat's innards are our body's workings, earth, water, fire, wind, the four bases, the helms, the post of wakeful remembrance, the bamboo poles, the clear mind's reflection. The sticks and scum are meditation's foes, preventing us from seeing what is real. The water whirls around like birth and death, drowning creatures in this carnal abyss. And here we then turn in the somewhat more personal or autobiographical uh, direction. It's not just the lust of creatures in general that he's reflecting on, but it's really his own. Alas, that this body does not spurn lust, and said it's spun around as in a gyre, and well, we weep and wail, for we forget to follow our Lord's flawless words of truth. Reflecting on myself, shaken and stirred, this is explicitly invoking San Vega here, thwarted by thirst for all earthly delights, I've seen the truth, but it's for girls I pine, fathers of lust and fonts of mystery. Lust yields not, for straining seals it tighter. My poor heart and its love are wrenched apart. Even if I take sacred writ as rule, worldly lust stands unhampered, unhindered. Ditching the Dharma cannot gallows this fire, desires pitch black like night with shapes unseen, seldom sloughed off, but fades, but it's never gone. And here he's, uh, he 
he's already in his 60s, I think, um, but is still you know, thinking about perhaps lust fading over the course of his life, but never being gone. Can washing tar stains silk remove the coal? To scrubs no use, the color changes not. Our stains are ever bound to their blackness as taints are tied to creatures thus enthralled. Don't fancy that you could somehow wipe them clean. Straining to let go, I'm locked in tighter. Practices stopped, not steady. Stayed, not still. I sit to rule myself with the dharma, like deckhands clearing the scum all at once. Once we pass through, the scum and sticks float back, again settling into the self-same clumps. The sticks and scum are like thirsting desire. We chop and clear, but choked remains the stream. He then continues this reflection as he sees the along the uh, along with the scum that's in the middle of the stream, but the, the carry on of uh, cats and dogs and other creatures uh, along the side. So again, in some sense, explicitly invoking this context of asubha kamarhana, the meditation on the decomposition of corpses. But here, it's not humans, but animal corpses that set. Um, his contemplation and motion. And on the right, he says, how transient the lives of all creatures. Again, uh, coming back to this sense of impermanence as a, uh, as a node for invoking Sambhaga, but here as somewhat of an antidote for this experience of lust that he's feeling along this journey, um, both thinking back to his wife and then also the people he sees along the way. I humbly strive to quake at corpse's sight, yet lust must still be burning inside me, for I think of my darling, my dear love, and permanence is only on my lips. Reflecting on the follow should purge desire, crush lust, and take me to the edge of trance, that is, into these progressively deeper states of meditation that texts like Nufisuti Manga describe as the key consequence of engaging in asupa meditation, etc. A true yogi would seize upon the object, that is the object of meditation, uh, Aramana. I've lost my calm and can't focus at all. To see a dead dog's corpse as my body cannot help disenchant me, my dear friends. Oh, what am I to do? Whoever's now protecting me, please point out the path. So I just wanted to bring this up as a kind of bridge so we can see that ideas around pleasure, particular sensual pleasure and its critiques are often tied to ideas around some vega in Buddhist poetry from these periods. Can I ask you just a quick yeah. question about this? Before in the stanzas before you, there, you had a number of times translated something as the real? Yeah. Is that yatabuta kind of thing or is that some other? I think it's uh, satya in this satya. Uh, yeah. in this context. Uh, I can. That's fine. I, 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 yeah. yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not something. Um, it's not a particular, particularly doctrinal term. Okay, that's that's, that's what I was curious about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but it was. I think it was something like satya in this context. In other words, the these truths cannot be seen um, because one is shrouded by. Yeah. The terms he uses to describe meditation, on their hand, are quite specific and doctrinal. Right. But when he's talking about there, it's, it's less. Okay. So, let me move on, uh, and I want to bring up a brief example. This poem, uh, Liedem writes, uh, reflecting on death and decomposition, reminds me of the skeletons, et cetera, and some Taiwan kept there to remind monks and people of impermanence. Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely, there's a very explicit connection between that practice in, in Thai temples, also appears in Laos and Cambodia as well, uh, but most prominently in Thailand, in, in my, to my knowledge, um, that's connected to this practice of Asupa Kamarhana, that a, in, in the absence of being able to go and attend an autopsy or in the absence of being able to uh, watch a corpse decompose in the forest that a skeleton, which is one of the stages in a super meditation, uh, being a key uh, focus uh, for that kind of practice. So you're, you're absolutely right. These are closely connected. One of the key uh, verse versions of the Buddhist uh, of the Buddhist life, um, composed in mid twentieth century Cambodia, is the Buddha Pawat Pika. That is the um, 
poetic version of the Buddha's life uh, composed by Myo Nun uh, in 1951. And this is a, I'm just gonna show you a brief excerpt. The, the whole uh, text passes through a number of different poetic meters and uh, offers a way of retelling the narrative of, of the Buddha within some of the forms of poetry that have become prominent by the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Cambodia. Here's the particular moment uh, that's often connected to uh, explorations of this idea of the Matima Padipada or this middle way or a moderate way in, in Buddhist texts. And it's the moment when the Buddha had been practicing, or the Buddha to be, the Bodhisattva Siddhartha Gautama had been practicing ascetic practices in uh, the woods for some six years and uh, destroying his, his body, uh, but still not attaining his goal of awakening. So as the text reads, one day Indra, Lord of the gods, descended from Drayastrimsha with a charming triple strung lute to strum and sing for the great man. And this triple strung lute uh, is in a Cambodian context tied to the Chapai uh, which is an instrument that actually has only two strings that one plays, but there's an additional string that's always part of the instrument. I don't know if it actually has a sympathetic resonance or it's just traditionally been there, whether it's tied to this narrative, but in temple murals of this scene, it's always this particular instrument that's, to, that's depicted. At first he tuned one string too taut and soon that chord snapped in twain. Now then a string too lax lacked a crisp twang. So he tightened the slack to retune it again. The moderate way, not too tight, or too loose, made all fall silent, listening to the strains strung together in songs, both long and short. The melodies rang true, old harmony. And so this is this key moment in the narrative of the Buddha's progress towards awakening uh, when he realizes that, well, too much in this direction of indulgence and hedonistic pleasure is not the way, and same uh, is can be said for too much um, overexertion and ascetic practices. So uh, I offer it as a way of, of framing how uh, ideas around pleasure and renunciation uh, show up in, in Buddhist texts uh, more generally. And we'll see uh, whether that um, is relevant to uh, the material we'll look at going forward. I want to bring us into some texts that are not necessarily ordinarily framed as particularly uh, Buddhist, uh, but that were often composed by Buddhist monks that would have been recited in Buddhist ceremonies um, and that are framed at the beginning and end of these texts in particular around Buddhist ideas. This one, Dung Tiu, is one of the most famous narrative texts in the Cambodian context. There are many different versions of it. On the right is a version by Ong Bung Khun, and on the left is the most is an image of the author, the most famous literary version from 1915 by Prepatumate or Prepatumat Hai Ngun Sao. And Sound's uh, version is the one that many Cambodian uh, school children have studied over the years. It's unclear where exactly the narrative comes from. Unlike many of the other poetic long narratives preserved in Buddhist monasteries uh, during this period in the 18th and uh, 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, there isn't a Thai or Lao parallel to this text. It's, uh, and it's clearly set in a Cambodian setting. Some versions of the uh, Royal Chronicles mention a similar narrative. That narrative is sometimes set in the 15th, 16th or 17th centuries. There's some disagreement in the Chronicles about that, but the historicity of that has been sometimes put in doubt by scholars. So um, what's important for us is that this is a story in which the hero, uh, Um, we see uh, on the, the right, uh, along with uh, Dio, his, uh, the heroine on, uh, it's also it's next to him. Uh, Dom is initially a Buddhist novice and uh, they fought, the two of them fall in love while uh, Dom is, is still in robes. Um, and it sets up this very long and, and tragic, ultimately very violent ending for, for all involved. 
Um, in some ways, it it's an arc that uh, is consonant with what we see in Lili Perla. But unlike Lili Perla, there's there's um, well, it's a very different story. I won't uh, get into the, the differences, but it's a, it's a very, very different story told at a really different time um, and is much more connected to exploring ideas around um, the consequences of leaving uh, the Buddhist order on disobeying one's teacher, on uh, the power struggles between the king and elites and the precarious position of uh, women um, who attract the interest of men of power. Um, the beginning of this text is one where we can see this kind of autograph, autobiographical framing and set of aspirations appearing. So I'll just briefly show you what's going on here. First, to just get a sense of the kind of internal and external rhyme, this very first uh, phrase here, uh, very first stanza in Khmer reads, Nith nang kla klaing bang jo da, la bok la bong la bang la bai kai kap chia, tang tai da mal ka mun chia, ni tien yu ye kli kli chai. And so that constant form of uh, alliteration and different types of rhyme, Nith nang kla klaing la bok la bong la bang la bai. Uh, uh, are all part of the particular craft that he's doing. Uh, and certainly in the way he frames it here, he's saying this is not an original composition, uh, but one that he's trying to uh, tune into a better literary composition. There's a lot of debate whether he plagiarized this from another poet, Sintobok, or whether this is a complete rewriting of the story. But in how he frames it, saying, I tried to retain, remove, and replace, but oral lore, this is this poly term, gita, like hearsay, I struggled to conserve, lest my diction should waste the very pith I matched it to the bequeathed yarns old time. Then he introduces his name with this kind of name riddle. If you remember, we saw in the, the text of the Anisangs of the benefits of the Akaravata, we had with the H, the U, and the N being articulated in this way. The same goes for how he explains his name, Sal. Then he gives a little bit of a sense of where he came from, that uh, how he ordained, that he uh, took, um, that his uh, preceptor, uh, then had him gradually ascend the Sangha hierarchy. Uh, and that in doing so, he became uh, freed in some sense from the deprivations of the, or the deprivations, the privations of the French uh, colonial regime. So when he writes here, embarking out for alms afar and near at hand, I feared not Thai. Uh, thai here is a Vietnamese word for teacher, but it's borrowed into the Khmer context uh, to mean the uh, civil servants often who were, were often Vietnamese and who were proficient in, in French during colonial, the colonial Cambodian period and who were uh, doing the, the work of the colonial administration, nor boy, lackey's boy being this uh, loan word into French and then into Vietnamese to describe the underlings of those civil servants who charges with their crimes and cherche claims of land without a proper card for want of embankments. Mm -hmm. Then he, in addition to citing himself with, situating himself within this particular early colonial, early to mid colonial period in Cambodia, he gives the date for the poem as we've seen in other compositions, um, which amounts to uh, 1915 AD. And then uh, he, then has this invocation uh, to the Buddha, to the Dharma and the Sangha, and begins this uh, closing portion to the preface where he, he prays for all of these different um, entities to whom he feels he owes a debt, uh, uh, particularly his preceptors and the other monastics who are involved in the ritual of becoming a monk, uh, as well as his parents, uh, and all these other different uh, beings that we have uh, looked at on, on back on Wednesday. So the virtues of water and mighty fire of sun, earth, the holy moon, holy wind, great stars and deities secluded in the 16 Brahma realms. 
And all of those, and this is down to stanza 28, may the glory of all these mighty ones whose shade and shelter is silent and serene grant me freedom from life's vicissitudes according to my heart's aspiration. Whatever sicknesses may come to me, may they never cause me illness inside, and my body be clear and unclouded, ever lustrous like the round of the moon. And after this opening uh, autobiographical statement and set of aspirations, we move into the story itself, where he begins by saying, let me recount the tale of a boy named Thum, raised in the paddy fields of Bapnum province. And we have a sense of how he's growing up. And then uh, we move to the, on the right page here, he and his fellow young novice monk, like, um, towards the, as they progress in their career as novices, this is down towards the bottom, unwholesome thoughts weighed down on Thum's body. And this is often a phrasing used to describe um, for those who are coming under the sway of lust or are interested in sensual pleasures, but um, are, they're being framed because they're monastics as uh, unwholesome thoughts. He confessed to Pleik, uh, to Pleik as if the two were one, Novice, but yoy. come on, help me out here. We're just selling a few trays at a time. Profits are down. Soon our business will fail. Don't you wonder about that old saying? At every place that's close and near, there's only rest if my girl's here. The ancients did not err in their true words, for we are too young, for we too are young men here in this world. You know nothing beyond begging for food. Shouldn't we break the mold and travel far? So then they come up with this plan. The abbot, their master, is quite suspicious of, you know, you know why, do, why do you want to do this? Are you sure that's, um, if this is good? And then on the bottom here, he says, go by all means, but stay out of trouble. Uh, don't act the fool if you see a girl. You shouldn't clown about or play around, lest your behavior spoil my good name. The shame of worldly disgrace and scorn defies the rules the Buddha set for monks. Once you've sold your load of these baskets they're making, uh, hurry back here. Don't tarry there to tally losses and gains. Then we get the narrative of how they uh, set off on this journey. And a portion here I've, I've, I've skipped in my translation. Um, but what I wanted to bring out is the way that the presence of these two uh, young monks arouses sensual desire in the people they visit. So uh, just in the second stanza here, some stared with spite at Thum, resenting his handsome body. Some fantasized of taking him back home. If only I could snatch and snuggle him close, I'd have my way with him. As they got near, they bristled with delight before his face. Probbing their new heartthrob against a well, the frenzy crowd gathered at a shaded knoll, the sight of a lovely town named Bodum Kav. Men and women alike amassed, aroused by Thum. Um, and so they, this sets off a, uh, a series of scenes in which they're trying to persuade the novices to, say, to stay. And then they begin to recite. And it's, it's Thum's uh, beautiful voice when reciting these kinds of Buddhist texts, particularly this version of the, the Santra Jataka that he ends up reciting. Uh, attracts the attention of people in the village, including Thum, uh, Theo, his eventual love interest. Thum's chanting voice was crisp and smooth and sweet. When he sang, all the people of the Bonk Mum rushed over to listen. Young lads, old men, widows, and fresh maidens all gathered around. And so this way in which ideas around euphony, around the aesthetic pleasures in sound in this text, framed explicitly as a Buddhist text, but really going into these quite secular themes, is tied to the sensual desire or arousal on the part of those uh, listening to them. So we have, again, this tension that's existing, particularly because the portions that are being recited are, in fact, uh, the the mourning of uh, Princess Madri and the mourning of the two children of Prince Vasantara who are being uh, given away. They're some of the most emotive scenes in the whole of, uh, of the Vasantara Jataka, sometimes scenes that might be associated with, with some vega, with other kinds of emotions that could be tied to religious context. But here they're serving in some sense to arouse the lay people who are, kind of, who are enchanted by the sensual pleasures of sound. And uh, 
just to sort of show you what that those scenes are that uh, Thun was reciting. This is from a Thai version from the Mahatma Kamluang. This is the oldest and one of the most influential um, bilingual Pali Thai versions of the Vasantara Jataka. And uh, I'll skip dis discussing its poetic form uh, for a moment, but just to give you a sense of what was being recited. This is probably the easiest one to read. Um, in this sermon version tied into this particular form of poetry, which also would have been recited uh, melodically, uh, we have the Pali portions in uh, plain Roman type and the Thai version, the Thai portions in um, bold, uh, where we have something like being led away, the children, oh monks, regarding the prince's two dear loves, the Brahmin whose heart was hardened, took them away as they cried out. And here, these are the two uh, children, Ganharjali uh, uh, and um, uh, Jolly and Krishna is the my way of saying. It. I forget that Jolly and Ganhajina, I think, is in the, in the Pali version, um, said to their father, These words which the two royal issue uttered to the Lord, the prince of the teachings, thus, please tell mom we aren't sick. Please, Lord, tell the princess that we are neither sick nor sad, ever free from pain. And you, dad, please be happy. As for you, Lord, please keep it well, for when suffering comes, we can bear it, O father. Our little elephants and horses, the lonely black elephant and horse figures lying here. And these are oxen, the wild oxen molded to be friends, still seen there. Please give them to Ma, the lions and the rest. Give them all to Princess Madri, our mother, our mother, please. By them her sorrow will end, that she may dodge grief's pain and waste. For when her faces she sees not, these toys should take their place, O oh Lord. And here it's this tragic misunderstanding on the part of the children thinking that these, these toys, whether than the, the presence of the children themselves would be able to placate Mandri when she comes back and sees that her husband, Vasantra, the has given away uh, their two children, uh, is what is designed to arouse this sense of pathos in the, the audience of these texts, particularly when portions like this get expanded in poetic versions and the Khmer versions that are being evoked in Dumtiu or greatly expand on these kinds of passages. And yet in uh, the narrative of Dumtiu itself, the kind of uh, narratives of mourning, even the way Samwega is evoked is tied to people being lost in the aesthetic pleasure of listening. Mm -hmm. Let me return now uh, to another text and uh, this is one where, again, we see this kind of interaction between ideas around sensual pleasure and Buddhist authors or Buddhist framings of text. So Paradiccia Sampia is celebrated today as one of the most important poets in Cambodian history. Um, we know a little bit about his life from the Chronicles. It's hard to tell exactly how much is historical. He lived quite briefly, probably was born at the beginning of the 17th century, so died quite young. And he is known for his, his, his quite learned works in, in a Buddhist sphere, his kinds of Buddhist didactic poetry, but he also left a body of romantic uh, poems. Uh, until recently, these were thought to be incomplete. When I was uh, visiting the British Library and going through and trying to help recatalog some of the Khmer manuscripts there, I came across to this particular version. Uh, which has complete versions of almost all of his uh, romantic poems. Wow. Uh, the, this particular manuscript dates from the 1830s and is one of a group of some of the oldest leporellos in, in Khmer script to survive. As you can see, it's not, it's a little hard to read in portions because uh, the, um, I'm forgetting the name for this kind of ink, um, but it has, uh, Rubbed Hodan. away in portions. Can you say it again? Hordan. Yeah, I just can't think of how to say Hordan in English. Like gold. Is it gold? It's, no, no it's I think not. it's called orpiment. Orpiment. Okay. Yeah. 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 Straight out of the Old Testament. <laughs> arsenic. Yeah, it's made. It's made of arsenic. Yeah, so it's an arsenic-based yellow ink like this. 
with uh, on this blackened uh, Leporello. So this text on the surface is, is purely a uh, romantic poem. In a way, it's a kind of uh, nirad or kind of niria, but traveling through time. In that sense, I think it has a certain parallels to the uh, Tawath al um, this poem of, of mourning and of uh, sensual longing uh, that's one of the masterpieces of Ayutthaya literature. There's a, a new translation of that um, available. I haven't seen it yet, but there's a new translation available from uh, Pasu Hong uh, Haji and, and Chris Baker. Um, this, uh, so my version of this poem, it's actually, it's a much, much shorter poem than uh, Tawat al-Samad. It's in, a, in the manuscript, it's joined with about um, 12 other uh, romantic poems attributed to Parit um, This one has this repeating line figure, which is, we saw in that much later uh, poem, the one on invoking the, uh, the sound of Kwang Kai or the, the drum, the funeral march poem that we explored yesterday. Um, and this opening line, is one that repeats at the beginning of uh, each of the stanzas in this uh, crow's gate meter, or uh, what's known as uh, or uh, in Thai. Uh, and the journey through time is just within the, the a single night from midday until the next morning. And he goes through this process of longing for his beloved through this close observation of both the, the beauty and the stirring power of nature. So it's a poem that's invested in articulating what's so moving about nature and also connecting it to his particular experience. Uh, it's also one that's very much tied to a Buddhist vision of cosmology and sort of ties the turning of a single uh, day and night to this, this broader cosmological vision. Uh, to some extent, I think is we can make this comparison to Tawat uh, al in the Thai context. That actually shows up even more in his uh, other romantic poems. But I think in this one, this fascination with the turning of the spheres uh, within the context of a romantic poetry by someone who is themselves quite a, a learned and religious po uh, person, to me really brings up this resonance with John Donne, uh, the 17th century. 16th, 16th, 17th. I don't know. Yeah, I think 1650 or something like uh, that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, poet who was who's known for his, his verse in this kind of genre. So if I'll just skip the beginning part here and go to this part. My soul of gold, twilight is come, the sun's rays high. How bright the moon, its disc soars high, soft light scatters, and darkness glows. My soul of gold, the moon glimmers, chief of the stars. When all is hushed, a bird song carries, rustling wind. Sorry, when all is hushed, bird song carries, a rustling wind douses the dusk. Mm -hmm. My soul of gold, evening arrives, the moon orbits around the pole of Mount Meru, its slopes gleaming with lunar light. My soul of gold, Moonbeam shimmer, I see your face, perfect and round, bejeweled by gems of twinkling stars far from the earth. My soul of gold, nighttime has come, the moon grows full, it's orbed and wrapped by constellations as the lone lord of starry skies. My soul of gold, here in this world there's only you, my golden friend, your skin exudes the finest bliss in realms of lust. And here he then goes more explicitly into what uh, he is particularly missing in the physical union uh, between him and his beloved. And we get this echo that we, uh, that we see also in Thai poetry of this period, uh, what's by contemporary literary critics uh, are usually referred to as bot asatan. Um, this term is probably coming out of the way uh, this sense of wonder is tied to the erotic scenes in the Lipala. But here, there's this way in which nature and sensuality are very clearly linked. My soul of gold, at such moments, my love would swell. We'd sing as one in search of bliss, our bodies joined to the same tune. 
My soul of gold, peals of thunder, rock me in waves as if you were here, our limbs entwined, murmuring nothings to draw out the time. And then as the poem ends, uh, we turn back to the quiet and longing. So it goes through this particular kind of arc, one that, as you mentioned, Alexander, it's interesting to see this reference to Mount Meru, this, uh, the reference to all this sort of cosmological elements and this close observation of what's happening in this change of time from day to night and back again um, within the context of a, 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 a romantic poem. Yeah, go for it. I've got some questions. So what's it, uh, just essentially the soul. So what, what is the original um, mm -hmm. term of Khmer? Oh yes, yeah. so this term is, so the, the opening line in Khmer is prlung mm -hmm. uh, mi Prlung is uh, equivalent in almost all cases with Thai kwan. Okay. Um, and so including all of the different uh, parallel rituals to uh, su kwan or of these soul recalling ceremonies in a Thai context, uh, in a Lao context, et cetera. Those are all paralleled by the Prlung in, in Khmer. Do you think about Wenyin? <laughs> Can you say it again? Wenyin. Yeah. But, yeah. So some people say it's Wenyin. Mm. Is it Angelian? So yeah. Mm. Yeah. For me, I think these are, I think of these as different kinds of con contexts. Yeah. So that, uh, something this term like vinyana of consciousness that gets uh, vinyan or in Thai or vinyan and Khmer that gets emphasized in Buddhist spheres can sometimes be uh, disconnected from this idea that I think of as quite a talkfulness idea of the kwan or the prlung, the souls that inhabit the body that are multiple, but are not involved in the process of transmigration. Um, and then the use of it here is. Uh, you know, it's the sense of of it's one's beloved because the the kwan is that which is so close to us. Mm -hmm. Just like sometimes uh, metaphors around love or tied to like lung ba, tied to our own eyes. Uh, this is something that's very common in Southeast Asian poetry. Like I love you the same way I love my own eye. Like you're that inseparable to me. That's same in the same way. That this is the the sense of using the word kwan. Like you're as close or as Beloved to me as the souls that inhabit my own body. Okay. It's like Quan Jai. Quan Jai, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So let me move on to uh, one more poem here and then uh, let me, we will open up to a bit more discussion. So here, I wanted to bring in another poem in which we see these kinds of tensions between you know, Buddhist ideas, poems being framed in a, in a Buddhist context, and also very clear ideas around uh, aesthetic pleasure as well as sensual pleasure. We see both of those kinds of pleasure in this work, Gakkai uh, by King Ang Luang. Mm -hmm. um, here, he, in the preface, um, I hail from the chief clan of Cambodia, a young royal born for sovereign bliss. Uh, having set out from our old capital, um, that is of Udong at this period, uh, in near Phnom Penh in Cambodia, I ventured to Bangkok, uh, city of angels. And here, this is politically very much connected to the time that he was one of several young uh, Cambodian monarchs during this period in which Cambodia was politically subordinated to Thailand that were raised in Bangkok during the early Ratanakosin period. There I penned this long poem rooted in sacred Pali scriptures, keeping with a tale still preached by reverend monks and teachers. And uh, he doesn't frame it here as uh, translating it from the Thai, instead frames it as translating it from the Pali. But of course, at this time, there was already a poem Gaki in the Thai context, and this is uh, very closely related to that. Um, there's a, a wonderful MA thesis by uh, Sang Zalpia um, at the Royal Academy of Cambodia that, uh, that deals with um, uh, sort of the development of literary poems, particularly long narratives in the 
uh, Cambodian literary context where they're known as uh, Sastra Labai. Uh, and in that she does some close comparisons uh, between the Thai and the Khmer versions of this story of Gaki or Gakai. In short, I warn, I wove this yarn into tidy verse to narrate a past life of our Lord Buddha, and my stanzas endured for long to come. My lords and commoners keep them in mind. And then he gives a framing to it that's explicitly connected to this Buddhist moral, one that's quite misogynistic actually in its framing, um, but tied to this idea of impermanence as well. And then uh, giving it a date, which allows us to date when he composed this poem. He didn't himself ascend the throne into, until, the 19, until the 1840s. Um, so he wrote this while still a young man uh, in, in Bangkok. And again, it ends with this kind of apology. My words may lack in true eloquence, for I simply follow what men of old inscribed in ancient tomes of Pali texts, not so wise to dare to rewrite scripture. Um, and then uh, when we go to the, the text itself, um, we see that it's framed again as a Jataka. I tell a tale of the Buddha, our great Lord, most merciful back when he was still perfecting the path to highest awakening. And then he takes this particular rebirth here as a Lord among the Garudas, like in other words, the chief Garuda, those who have, have the shape of eagles with limbs of men. It's a, um, uh, an important figure in Tai Lao and, and Khmer art as well. And so we learn a little bit about where he, he dwells. And sorry. And then we're introduced to the king, the human king of the realm, Brahmadatta. We now go into this long and quite elaborate description of the palace. And elaborate descriptions of palaces are a key motif in mainland Southeast Asian uh, literature, particularly in Thai, Lao, and Khmer literature. Uh, it's very common to have these long, elaborate, and aesthetically sort of rapturous descriptions of what the palaces uh, were like that try to capture their, their beauty and might. So we certainly see that in the Smuda Kod Kham Chan, an important piece of early Ayutthaya literature. Uh, we see some aspects of this in the Lilit Pala, the story of uh, King Law that we uh, looked at the other day. Um, and it's very much present in the, that masterpiece of uh, Lao literature that we looked at the preface to Sang Sin Sai by uh, Mang Kam. Uh, again, replete with these very elaborate descriptions of the pleasures and the beauty of the palace. So uh, here I'll skip to the second uh, description of it. Above it all rose palaces and five towered I wish I knew how to pronounce this word, having translated it. Uh, Quincuncial arrays, I think. Topped by Shiva's sharp tridents gleaming against the dazzling sky. There were buffalo chins, Brahma faces, quartets of spires and sky blossoms. Uh, with fierce Garudas and Nagas locked in perpetual battles, all bedecked in golden gems, all was covered in silver gloss, finer than the heavens themselves, as is fashioned by holy hands. The royal beds made of gold and laid with thousands of shining gems shone and shimmered by perfect prisms, breathtaking beauty brought to life. The king's three-story royal palace was filled with dazzling ornaments shaped like lotus leaves and buns, all interlaced and twisted braids. On top were angels bent in prayer, beneath them nagas fought their foes. Down to the bottom, fierce ogres supported all the weight with clubs. Canopies and parasols leafed in gold, sparkling with their blazing fringes, studded with rows of precious jewels glittered under the solar light. His audience hall was ornamented with floral plinths from floor to ceiling. His harem with its feminine forms had walls inlaid with glowing gems. And so the description of this wealthy and righteous king is very much tied to the glory and the aesthetic pleasures of his palace. Um, as well as those who inhabit it. The royal court was always packed with ministers tasked with governing, with poets charged with the pen, with priests entrusted to chant, with wise sages and astrologers, with craftsmen skilled in every trade, with top singers of every tongue, with dancers of dazzling beauty. And this idea of singers of every tongue, we see this also in the Ayutthaya context, uh, back to the question that um, 
I think Eric, you raised around the cosmopolitan nature of the Thai state in various periods, this idea of Sipsong Hasa, the 12 uh, languages or the 12 ethnicities is something that's constantly evoked and performed through a musical dimension. So that's what's being sort of said here with this top singers of every tongue, with dancers of dazzling beauty. What are the Sip Song? I forget the, the list, right, right, right. Um, but it, it includes, it's a quite diverse list of different Southeast Asian languages, but also people from Europe, East Asia, the South Asia and the Middle East. Then uh, we have a, a description of this, um, of Kaki herself. So Kaki is the consort of the king. And these detailed descriptions of the beauty of particular heroes and heroines is again, a staple feature of poetry, including poetry explicitly framed as Buddhist of this, of this period. So uh, his dear consort was named Kaki or Kakai and Kai, fairer than any in the land. No girl could match her fine beauty. She was the queen of womankind. Her birth was a pure miracle as if burst forth from a lotus. So again, this way in which Buddhist images of purity are tied into a uh, presentation of the aesthetics of physical beauty. Her face gleamed brighter than the moon, her hair darker than a black bee stripe. Her forehead glowed like a popul. A popul in Khmer is a, a ritual object that's made out of polished metal and is passed around, particularly in ceremonies connected to prolong uh, to the spirits or, or kwan. Um, but usually popul in uh, Khmer literature translated from Thai is translating the word uh, when, when in the sense of mirror, uh, so like a reflecting glass. So I think that's possibly here why it has this, this term, because like a mirror, it would reflect clear in complexion, full of charm. Um, her smile bloomed in effortless bliss. Her lips were full, her words winsome. And then it continues to go throughout her whole uh, body describing all the ways in which it's um, beautiful and captivating her neck, her eyebrows, her teeth, her breasts, her thighs, every limb, her scent, etc. Um, and it it goes into some detail around how how joyful this union, including the sexual union between the king and his queen are. Then we get this other scene where the Buddha to be, the Bodhisattva, who's this Garuda, um, gets uh, curious about this, uh, about what's happening in the court. And uh, he um, gets a chance to uh, present himself uh, to the king. And uh, the king is delighted. Come here, my lad, come here, my friend. And the they begin to play this game of dice. So it's this gambling game that brings the Buddha to be and the king together in this story. Um, and then we have uh, just the last part I'll bring out in this story. At that moment, Queen Kakti, uh, the foremost lady in the court, as the afternoon gave way to dusk, was looking for her happy king, for he had not yet returned to take his place on their shared bed the most auspicious spot of all. So she called out and asked, where has his ladies of the harem? Where is my Lord? Where is his majesty gone? And they say that, you know, he's, he's playing now with this, his, this handsome youth. In other words, the Buddha has transformed himself from a Garuda into the form of a handsome youth. And he's incredibly beautiful. No one can compare with him. So her curiosity is piqued and goes to take a glance at what's happening. She stopped to catch a glimpse of the Garuda's body and fell in love, her heart filled with such excitement to take that bird man as her mate. The Garuda, still playing with the king, happened to glance towards Kaki and felt the thrill of love arise, delighting in desire's rush. Silently, he thought, how stunning is that lady? This is what is called beauty. I'm overwhelmed by my good fortune the girl can compare with her. This is charm. This is elegance. A match to her could never be found. I've seen many beings in the world, but never a lady as lovely as her. Even the angels in the heavens couldn't match the girl before me. Not one blemish could be found upon her resplendent body. And 
the emphasis, this constant emphasis on purity, on shining, on resplendence is echoed in the description of Buddhas and Buddha images, as well as these heroes and heroines alike. Um, there's a certain set of vocabulary terms that are invoked in both cases. Um, and, and without seeing what particular pronouns are being used or who is being the subject of the description, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell. Is this description of a particular character or is this a description of, of a Buddha who glows in these particular ways? And so then he, he falls in love, asks for Gaki. She caught the Garuda staring at her body. She smiled coyly and looked at him from the corners of her eyes, fanning the flames of his love. Whenever the Garuda locked eyes with her, she giggled and smiled and shrugged it off. And furtive joy, she shot him glances and flashed him a secret smile. Seeing all this, his skin tingled and his belly leaped into his chest, lost in love. Dice gave him no relief. He thought only of carnal bliss. He turned away to focus on the game and turned back, stealing a gander. He peeked for a sideways glance, his eyes never tiring of her sight. She feigned a fall, letting her sash slip down from her shoulder, revealing a pert breast. His heart quavered, stirred by the thrill. So again, we have this, some of the same verbs that are used in the context of some vega, which literally has the sense of being shaken, of being moved, of quivering inside, appears in these uh, erotic scenes as well. Aroused, he longed to ravish her and almost rushed to embrace her and whisk her away at once, but realizing his repute would suffer, rested himself back to the game. So I have one more text that I'd like to take us through that's a meditation text that deals with some of the same kind of imagery that we've seen uh, throughout in uh, these different reflections or facets of pleasure in poems that are explicitly framed as Buddhist texts in Southeast Asia. But before we get there, I just wanna pause to have a sip of water and uh, ask if you have any questions or things you're wondering about or would like to engage. I can offer anyone here a cup of tea. I'm going to get a cup of tea. Would anyone like one? Slip down, I'm just... And those of you on Zoom, please treat yourself. Sorry, we can't <laughs> offer to you. It's actually really interesting that Agduan read this poem. Mm, tell us more. Well, I'm just... Thinking, I mean, I guess kings have lots of spare time to cultivate themselves. Mm. Yes. But, um, yeah. So he wrote this. Uh, the story doesn't end there. It says yeah. lead him. The Garuda has to win the game. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But, I mean, you know, it's obviously you know, it's like the um, Mahabharata and all that sort of stuff. Yes. But um, but he also did that cremation poem where he tells them to scatter his corpse in the forest, that must have been an interesting person. Mm -hmm. So in the, the sort of contemporary perspective of looking back on Andung, he's often credited with like this restoration of Cambodian artistic and literary and religious traditions um, after a period of Siamese domination. So that's you know, referring to the time in which he ascends the throne. Some sources put that at 1848, he reigned to about 1860. But this is, it's interesting, this early period, he had time, it seems to, you know, craft, this is just a, maybe, I forget, it's a sixth or fifth or so of the whole, the whole poem. Um, but to create, you know, have time to work in literature. Yeah, um, obviously well educated. Was he, he was ordained as, was he Tommy? It's pretty early for Tommy, though. but he was ordained by, um, with the crowd that, he's working on. Yes. Yeah. So he was ordained. In... Yeah. Yeah. And was instrumental in sort of the rise of some like Ban, uh, in bringing the uh, order uh, yeah. uh, to Cambodia in the 1850s. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, uh, most of the Buddhist poetry in Khmer, so uh, where, is, um, where they are records, it's, it's in the manuscript or it's in the printed? Oh, it depends. So almost all of the texts that we've looked at today um, and actually throughout that have been in Khmer, uh, there are manuscript sources for them. 
but there are also print sources. So um, in some cases, in my translations, I was working from manuscripts, like in the case of Paris Sophia. Uh, in other cases, like in this of Kakai of King Angduang, I was working from a printed text, but there are plenty of manuscripts that, that survive as well. Um, yeah. So just like in the case of Thailand and in a sort of analogous to the sort of the long, the process by which uh, texts written in uh, and also in literary Sinitic were either trans, uh, transliterated into Gokmu or um, Roman script Vietnamese or translated from literary Sinitic into uh, Vietnamese. That was taking place end of 19th century, first half of the 20th century. Um, so the most intensive period of that. Uh, also, if we think in the Thai context, the way in which towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there was an effort to, to gather uh, uh, literary texts that were preserved in manuscript form and then publish them and make them available. That's sort of the ongoing work of Grom uh, Sin, the fine arts uh, department, among the other things uh, they do, and also the work of the National Library. Um, Similarly, in the Cambodian case, uh, publications of these works began actually at the end of the 19th century with some publications first printed in uh, France or Vietnam and wherever there were printing presses available, but then increasingly in Hanoi, yeah, some of the earliest ones. And then eventually in, in Cambodia itself by the, the 20s and 30s. So that's the pattern we see. But not everything that's represented in a print source um, is uh, there are abundant manuscript sources. So some things have been, because so many manuscripts have been lost in Cambodia, particularly 1970, 1990, sometimes the print sources are extremely valuable. Uh, in other cases, there's a whole bunch of material, particularly more explicitly Buddhist material that never made it into print. Basically all the sermon and ritual material and manuals, none of that was ever printed. So it only exists in, in manuscript form. But the literate, many of the most prized literary texts did end up being printed during the 20th century. Looks like this was in the Royal Chronicles. Some of his stuff was in the Royal Chronicles. Mm. Uh, I'm just looking at this Chandler article, which might not be all there is to it because it was so old. But so that it would have gotten included in the Royal Chronicles, the Bhagavata. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Okay, you, oh, you found a printed version, but it didn't say anything about Royal Chronicles. So he's talking about Chronicle P63, uh -huh. Chronicle blah, 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 blah. Somebody's PhD dissertation. Chat my Rajakan T4. But it wouldn't have Ang Duan's poem in it. So, the, in some versions of the Royal Chronicles, you, there are some literary the references to literary texts, to the composition of literary texts. Uh, there are, I'm sure, some that include entire literary texts. Shastra Labai. Um, just to levite. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. It's an interesting question. You just made me realize. I have no idea where this stuff comes from. Mm -hmm. Recopied in 1951 and 1971 at the Buddhist Institute. The, so this is Shastra, a literary text or a royal um, chronicle? Shastra Labite uh, Rabaksa. Uh, yes. John. Yes, so these uh, chronicle concerning the Rabain. Yes, so th these chronicles, particularly the ones uh, that were edited by consult, um, uh, those that are like uh, those um, were ones like other kinds of royal chronicles that were copied and preserved in monastic libraries and also preserved in royal collections. The same goes for these kind of literary texts. They were preserved in monastic libraries and copied in manuscript form and also within elite collections connected with the aristocracy and the royal palace. Mm -hmm. Other questions or things you're thinking about at this time? So is he coming back? I assume so. Is, uh, is I'm just thinking like, you know, sometimes it, have you ever found the MCC fabled MCC microfilms? 
<laughs> Olivia keeps dribbling that out. But... No, I haven't. Not the actual microphones. No. Yeah, the rumors they're, they're in France. Uh, Have you heard this rumor? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. So I keep asking. And then sometimes you just wonder if they're not tucked away and sort of Sukhni is sitting on them, like waiting, you know. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, you haven't found them. No, I've just seen the things that have been published yeah. out of them. That recent collection. Yeah. So apparently, right before the war, all the microfilms disappeared. And then some people say the Vietnamese stole them, and some people say that somebody's got them in France, and some people say, you know, just because nobody's gone into the basement of the Buddhist Institute, you know, I got it. You know, who knows? Yeah. Mm. Do you think the Vietnamese ran off with them? No. <laughs> Conspiracy theory. <laughs> I'm just looking yeah. at some, I'm just wondering if about circling back to some of the big questions you started. Okay, absolutely. Let's do it. This is the big yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not to trip, not to, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about that another time. But, um, you know, at the beginning of the week, you, you, you posed the question about, you know, what makes poetry or what, what, what constitutes verse or what are its unique features or how are we to, okay. should we, how are we to single it out from other literary forms and, in, in in uh, the Buddhist sort of literary corpus, putting aside for the, a moment, I think the question of what constitutes a Buddhist text or not. Yeah. Um, I just wonder if people have ended up somewhere else, mm. you know, um, mm. with some of, one of, some of these framing questions. I mean. Like if it's in the Royal Chronicle, is it a poem? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a kind of interesting version of it, exactly. That, that is there. Are we just speaking about a form, in other words, that certain sort of metrical features and um, phonic patterns and all the rest of it, or is there some something beyond that? Or um... and that sort of reminds me of the question that Eric asked for us: of like, is there a difference between Buddhist poetry and Buddhist, Buddhist verse? verse? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes, Eric. I, I, do we rescue us with something? Interesting. Does poetry count, Eric writes, as a genre of literature? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, does poetry as a genre of literature address or grapple with the Buddhist doctrinal issues that you have foregrounded in these last three lectures? Indebtedness, shock, pleasure, in a distinctly different way than would be the case in other literary genres. Commentaries, suttas, birth stories, chronicles, hagiographies, etc. Which is to say, are these doctrinal themes unpacked or expanded upon in particularly unique directions when mediated through poetic verse? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so for instance, themes around uh, indebtedness to parents is, and as well as to other particular uh, beings, is one that we see most emphasized actually in poetry in terms of written texts that survive as opposed to uh, commentaries or birth stories, chronicles, all, all the manuals, all the other kinds of genres that one might um, imagine. And so that link, I think, is surprised me. It's one of the one of the reasons I wanted to talk about uh, indebtedness. And these kinds of poems and books of poems that are all about indebtedness to parents, gratitude to parents, uh, show up in the Vietnamese and Thai and Lao and Cambodian Buddhist texts. It's very easy in a contemporary uh, Buddhist bookstore in those particular cultural contexts to find all kinds of new books that are coming out all the time that mm -hmm. have poems that people are composing today on uh, those very themes. I think the same thing goes for this, this theme of shock. Though this appears in other texts as well, it gets particularly emphasized in poetry, particularly poetry recited for funerals or for end of life contexts. Why it shows up more there and less in the sermon literature mm -hmm. that gets transmitted in mainland Southeast Asia is a, is a question for me. But I think it's about the particular aesthetic vehicle mm -hmm. of poetry, particularly poetry that's meant to be recited mm -hmm. and sung or otherwise put into a sonic space that works well with the uh, questions of uh, gratitude, questions of samvega. Uh, questions of these narratives of mourning that are often tied uh, to both of those. Uh, in terms of even the theme that we explored today around uh, pleasure and the different forms of pleasure, I think we see this again most emphasized in the poetic context, and it's where we see this 
shading between texts that are end up framed in very explicitly Buddhist ways, but end up being uh, going quite deeply into uh, the aesthetic beauty of particular spaces or sensual pleasures. The, the theme we looked at sort of more early on around aspiration and benefits, that's not particularly limited to poetry. That we see in all kinds of other different genres. But I'm curious now in thinking about the way you frame the question, whether we might also be able to say that something distinctive mm -hmm. is going on when things are in a form of verse. And John Marston yeah, writes, I guess question. one way of formulating the question would be whether there was a general conception of poetry other than the specific meters being used. And this, in terms of just thinking about the words that are uh, used, it's sometimes it's possible um, to find, we, we see a bit of both. Um, let, me, let me back up. In late, 19, in late 19th century, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, and through the middle of the 20th century, there was a real interest in trying to catalog and name and determine the limits of particular verse forms. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the parallel case in uh, in Vietnam. I, in both that you mean but, vernacular verse forms? Particularly vernacular verse forms, but there was also an interest in tying those vernacular verse forms back to the kinds of works of uh, meter in Pali and in some case Sanskrit sources as well. So there was a renewed interest in texts like the Vutodaya mm -hmm. uh, Pali texts on, on metrical forms and trying to understand those in that context. Of course, there were other periods, particularly in Thai literary history, if one looks at uh, textbooks like the Tinamoni that attempt to catalog mm -hmm. verse forms in ways. If one looks at even what the slide we have up here now, this is an early 19th century example to catalog and put in stone all of the different verse forms. Mm -hmm. But it's a way of which somehow during this period there was an interest of defining uh, poetry as consisting in particular meters. And right. that being the definition of poetry. So that, then that's that's a quite elite definition of po that's, you know, yes. like a caveat type definition yes. of poetry, which is, in a way, I, 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 I sorry to jump in here, but no. I just I think John's question is an important one in, in a way in, in which in what way is your think is this thinking or these as these as example of poetry, do they overflow or expand beyond the caveat like kind of restrictive, more restrictive understandings, very much elite understandings of poetry. If, as you say, there, there's, a, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is there is an attempt to deliberately map these forms of vernacular poetry onto a kind of, um, again, this word elite's not great, but, you know, um, certain uh, uh, forms of, of certain metrical patterns that have a certain kind of status yeah. within the, you know, historic, the, the, I guess, the, the high traditions Absolutely. of Southeast Asia. So to what extent, I guess, so as a really inelegant way of asking the question, yeah. to what extent do you think these poet, poetic examples are examples of that or something that extends beyond that? Something that wants to embrace, that wants to have a kind of a folks poetry, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah. Vernacular. So many of the examples, particularly on the days we looked at debt and shock, were coming from non-elite examples. Yeah. Uh, unlike today, this we were looking more at elite yeah. examples in this context. The, the broad point that I think is interesting to consider here, and the, the late Peter Corrette in some of his um, yet unpublished work has argued that in the case of Lao poetry, this 20th century um, perspective of trying to make Lao poetry fit into these uh, particularly categorizable metrical forms, mm -hmm. it's something that, that, that they were getting from similar developments in, the, in Thai literary studies of the period. Mm -hmm is does a disservice to the Lao literary tradition because it, it, it makes it impossible to see how the verse forms um, were actually used and appreciated by poets in earlier periods. So there's a danger when we take these elite definitions of poetry 
as a standard on which to view all kinds of literary production in mainland Southeast Asia. And I think that's very true for the kinds of Buddhist texts in Cambodia and Laos, for instance, mm -hmm. that aren't always following particular elite literary conventions mm -hmm. that are frequently composed as acts of devotion. Like if we think of the, the, this, the one poem we looked at by, by Hun, who is giving the benefits of reciting the Sakarawat? That's the only sort of example of that survives. It may have, you may have been the one who to write it down in that manuscript, and it's connected to this very personal record of his life story. In other words, there was a whole process of composing and writing poetry uh, that was not didn't have any kind of elite ambitions or wasn't mm -hmm. aiming to be spread over a broad area, but was connected to this very practice of conserving manuscripts and of reciting poems from mm -hmm. them. There's also a whole oral dimension that's yeah. taking place yeah. in terms of many people are who are hearing, who are memorizing, who are reciting yeah. poetry themselves are not literate. Yeah don't care about the yeah. definitions of these different meters. Yeah. Uh, for them, uh, it's what's living, it's what's uh, happening you know, internally for these poems yeah. that makes the traditions come alive. And yeah. I think uh, Buddhist poetry, if to use this term, uh, kind of exists between these two, like spaces that we might yeah. exist, uh, label as elite and very written focused as opposed to, yeah. uh, places outside of that that are engaged much more in the oral performance and reception yeah. of the poetry. Yeah. 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 No, I was just agreeing with you, um, actually, that it was two separate spaces mm. with some intersection in the middle. Yeah. Yes. But, but even between those two spaces, there, there is something which is distinct from say poetry, and I'm sure in literary studies, they must have all kinds of debates like this. So yes. I, you know, like, but it, just, I just want to say, like, I know nothing about these debates, but it just seems to be that, you know, it's my conventional crass understanding of like how we think of poetry mm -hmm. in, in say contemporary North America or New Zealand. Is there something, you know, one of the things that distinguishes it is, is this sort of idiosyncratic creative act of individuals in which they express a kind of inner sentiment in it, while also kind of maybe acknowledging the limitations of of of, of language, right? And so it's so. However, in in the two polls that you've just identified, I'm you know the kind of elite written um, convention heavy, kavya like sort of style of poetry, and in the in, in the vernacular, which focuses much more on recitation of an already existing poem. Mm -hmm that kind of expression of inner sentiment of, on the part of the author, um, th that's really not there in either side to my mind in the sense that um, what the virtuosity in the first kind of poetry is not a, a, the virtuosity as assessed based on the, um, its sentimentality or its kind of, you know, ability to, um, the, the purpose being to kind of, for the, for the author to, it's part of the purpose that to express their kind of inner sentiment, but it's not the, the, the kind of main T loss of a, of a poem. Yeah. So where does that fit into this? And there's other, and then Eric has something here too. Yeah. So let's, let's, but that's, I think a really key question of where, the, where the place of the author is in this kind of the place of the author. Yeah. yeah. Because so often in Buddhist poems, that part gets elided or is forgotten over time intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, but it's very much tied to the author's, if it's framed as a Buddhist poem, to the author's aspiration, to the set of prayers that they're making mm -hmm. around the composition and transmission of, mm -hmm. of a poem. There's also an element in which the virtuosity of the poet is tied to the recitation, yeah. uh, their voice, the way they mm -hmm. use in a put it into a melodic form. Some, yeah. some forms are connected to also playing a musical instrument at right. the same time. And those are also forms in which one is expected to not just recite an established poem, but also would be changing it, would be improvising certain sections. And that bardic tradition yeah. is intersects a little bit with Buddhist ideas as well. So to make sure we catch the the different comments that have been made in the chat. So does it make sense? I think this is Eric writing uh, to think about poetry as genre versus poetry as aesthetic form technique. I think it does. I mean, in contemporary um, there's no other uh, additional. Southeast Asian sort of yeah. ways of discussing poetry in a literary studies sense, 
there's always sort of general terms that are used like uh, or in a Khmer context that are designed to talk about poetry in general as a genre, uh, as opposed to uh, poetry as particular kinds of techniques or forms or meters. Um, but as you raise this other important question, does this distinction apply in the Southeast Asian poly slash vernacular um, Theravada world? Yes, I mean, I think it's operating, but I think the question to which it's operating historically is one that I'd be curious to understand about, like um, what that, yeah, what, what that would mean. My, my sense is, for instance, in the Lao context that the evidence we have further back in time suggests that people talked about different performative genres. Mm -hmm. In other words, poems that were to be recited in different styles or by different groups of people in, in different contexts. That's how different genres were defined, not by the meter and not by a general sense of something being defined as poetry. And then what happens in a modern context is that we get the labels that are being defined as what are the particular poetic forms in a metrical mm -hmm. structural sense, as well as this overall conception of like Lao literature to make Lao literature something that's legible in a transnational context, mm -hmm. as well as a, an aesthetic sense of well, this is poetry as a genre so that particularly in the context of in being in dialogue with say Thai or French um, poetic traditions is sense that, oh, well, we too in Laos have poetry. This is how we might define it. But that uh, elides again, something mm -hmm. more complicated happening over history. Alexander uh, writes, uh, why is it necessary to define poetry uh, in a Buddhist context? This is a great question. Does it have to, anything to do with the fact that its content is religious? And I think this is the questions that we <laughs> began with. Like there's a certain possibilities that are engendered by using these labels, Buddhist yeah. and poetry. Um, like for me, I like being able to make intersections across mainland Southeast Asia. So we were able to think about these issues outside of a particular national context, which is the, the yeah. primary way in which thinking yeah. about literature in Southeast Asia gets siloed. But there's also a danger in that because both <laughs> Buddhist and poetry uh, allied so much of what's going on and it's imposing a set of yeah. labels on, on things. So I think we've, we've all been seeing the, the, some of the dangers and limitations of that. And Eric, you write, uh, yes, what of ballads and other forms of oral poetic verse in a folk or a non-aristocratic register? And this is again, what we had just, framed, uh, had just mentioned. Are these framed as Buddhist in any specific sense by Southeast Asians in the uh, pre-colonial era. I think, again, that's really hard question yeah. to access, but one that I'd, I'd like to try to explore more. So much of the sources we have, uh, pre-colonially speaking, are elite. So we get a, a vision of who was able to afford a donation to be able to erect an inscription in yeah. the context of that, or who is going to be mentioned in royal uh, chronicular traditions, et cetera. Uh, and in that, we might be missing something. But I think what you mentioned about ballads or other forms of oral poetic verse is really key for how uh, poetry in living performance traditions, the musical instrumentation yeah. and the musical qualities and also the context in which they would be performed is a key uh, way in which these might be understood. And there it's hard to describe what's Buddhist and what's not because so many of those genres say in a Lao context are ones that might not be performed within the, the um, Bubosita hall, within the most sacred precinct of the temple but could be performed within the general boundaries of the temple. Don't have to be necessarily mm -hmm. performed by monks, could be connected to temple festivals and fairs. And so the gradation between what gets labeled as Buddhist mm -hmm. and, and not becomes very complicated in that realm. Is the, in, in, a, in a context of recitation, what is valorized more, if, I, if you put it that, in terms, like fidelity to the original poem or um, improvisation by the reciter? I think this depends on the particular genre. So right. there are a number of Lao and Cambodian genres. I'm sure there are Thai genres, I'm just not familiar with them, that are based around 
an improvised, often comedic or flirtatious yeah. repartee yeah. between uh, several um, uh, performers. Yeah. Also, the certain kinds of uh, storytelling, long stories, like even like Bumpio could be yeah. told in that kind of bardic uh, tradition. But then, then it would be beyond poetry for you, I want to say. It'd be performance, mm. yeah. sonic beyond, space. It, would you say that? Still, to me, it's still poetry. Okay. Sonic yeah. space, performance, yeah. poetry. Yeah. You're saying that is all linked, aren't you? Yes. And I'm just thinking these two monks, Dom, uh, Dom and Beck, they go to the marketplace and people beg them to recite yeah. a poem. Um, so, but it, it's not just reciting, it's his beauty and this. I'm just trying to think of the box that we're putting around yeah. this. <laughs> I mean, because in, in a way, I feel like the, 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 the category. Everything's Buddhist, pre-colonial. Well, not so much the, the question of Buddhist, which I think is just not, it's, it's sacred. Not, it's, I mean, it's like Maori spirituality, you know, everything is spiritual. But more the question of poetry. Like, I mean, once you look yeah. before the 19th century, at least in the stuff that I do, yeah. like the, asking the question whether or not it's Buddhist is, is just it relevant? totally almost yeah. irrelevant. I mean, there's no term, right? Yeah. But the, um, the, the question of, like, I'm just sort of, I think I'm getting to your impulse here, mm -hmm. which is that you do want to connect things. You want to open up an, a space of inquiry. In, in this, let's just maybe maybe we can take a take a different approach. We could use a kind of a ap, you know the apophatic approach where we're like, what is it not? So it's not didactic as its primary purpose. It's not um, it's not Budavach. You, you, you would you would say. Uh, so what else is it not? Well, it's not commentary. It's sometimes it's didactic and sometimes it's <laughs> to me to me the way I guess I'm defining it is particularly unadventurous and that. It's that which is in verse. Right. And connect, Buddhist poetry is that which is in verse okay. and connected to, it's either framed as Buddhist or connected to Buddhist ideas. Right. That, that Including the verses we see in, say, Tipitaka and all the rest of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. I was focusing on this vernacular context yeah, yeah. Uh, because that's the, those are the ones that most frequently come alive in performance traditions. Yeah. Um, and were most frequently studied. So yeah. for instance, in a mainland Southeast Asian context, the great verse collections of the Tibetica, like the Tamabad, the Dvutuka, the um, Dana, even the Terig uh, Terigata, Teragata, those were transmitted in manuscript form, but were rarely studied on their own. So mm -hmm. the Tamabad Atakata with the narratives that go yeah. with each of the 420 or so, 423 verses of the Tamabad, those narratives were very closely studied. And of course the verses show up, they're studied, yeah. but it's rare to find manuscripts of just the mula of the, the yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and it, there doesn't seem to be any tradition of reciting or, or studying those. Of course, in a Purita context, many of the Purita texts yeah. are in verse, some are also in prose, yeah. um, but they weren't necessarily always studied as poetry in, in that context. Mm -hmm. So linking, a, linking them, making this link between verse form Buddhist themes and a performative context seems essential to yeah. me. And yeah. that's why I kind of focused on examples that bring those three together. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the orientation toward the performative context then is the de defining feature. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if they didn't sound good, they would have been forgotten a long time ago. They wouldn't have survived. I mean, there is that, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they're irrelevant, you know. I mean, I think there, there you're on the most. I, mean, I think that's kind of where I feel like your heart might be really with this, mm -hmm. you know, the principle, the implicit principle of selection. Because I think, I think the explicit principle that you just doesn't do justice to the kind of the corpus that you are trying to call forth into view, you know? Yeah. That makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Like, I don't think anybody recites on Duan's version anymore. Do not they? anymore. No, yeah. no. So yeah. it's not standing the test of time. Yeah, but there's also a way in which these longer uh, and more elite kinds of verses get transferred into a modern reading culture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Educated um, people like Sasabia. Yeah. Well, like every great lecture series, we are left with more questions than answers. <laughs> uh, Eric, Eric has, I think the performance is key, particularly in the pre-colonial era. And yet we have these inscriptions of verse. Yes. 
as as what pole in, in the current image. Yes, I think we're <laughs> absolutely left with that contradiction. Uh, Eric, I thought we'd wrapped it up there, man, but uh, cracked pull, it back pull open. The rug out. <laughs> Um, I, I'm just aware of the time and I um, there's so much more we could do and this is a, a very you know this is auspicious symbol of a so auspicious um, feeling at the end of a, of, a, of a lecture series but I just want to take this moment and just to thank you Trent for yeah. really kind of exciting and I think for everyone here just totally thought-provoking and extremely erudite set of lectures and we're just so grateful for it and we hope we can continue to have conversations with you as, as time goes on but um thank you so much thank you to to all of you for making this 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 possible i'm i'm so happy to have this chance to be in discussion with you thank you for being willing to bring in your comments over the chat and for those of you here in the room not just today but throughout the week I really appreciate everything that you've brought to this so i've i've learned so much i'll be going back to the recordings to listen to the moments when you were talking and asking questions. I will <laughs> recoil in horror at the sound of my own voice, but for those other parts, there will be much for me to productively return to. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. So I will uh, turn this up. We go, we'll wait for all the thank yous to come and then we'll, we can end the recording. So thanks everybody. I will keep keep your eyes on the university, uh, our Facebook page, and you'll see the links to these um, lectures eventually. All right. I was looking for meditation texts that you.